Hi, I'm uh, Eitan Zlotowinski near the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory 81st Symposium. And with me is uh, Uli Schibler from the University of Geneva. And uh, Uli, you study uh, the regulation of the circadian clock. And uh, perhaps uh, as a background setting, uh, perhaps you could uh, describe how um, the circadian clock is um, regulated throughout in all, throughout the body and all the, the cells of, of the organisms, the process known as uh, phase and treatment. Right, so perhaps the first thing to say is that the question is why do we even study these circadian clocks? Well, since about four million, four billion years there is life on Earth and these organisms were exposed to change the light dark cycle which we call the photo period mm. and of course this changes the entire behavior of most organisms at least those that are sensitive to, to light so we have a rest activity cycle some of us like uh, humans are more active during the day whereas the laboratory rodents we are working with like mice and sometimes rats are nocturnal they're more active during the during the night and they sleep during the day in their burrows now you could say uh, why do we need the clock uh, you know we see whether it's light or whether it's dark so we could just adapt our physiology to light or dark but of course the difference is that the clock let organisms to anticipate time so imagine there is a mouse that is uh, inactive during the day but it never knows when it should be active so every 10 minutes you have to come up and check whether it's light already it could never sleep and then maybe uh, snakes would already wait you know during the day and eat it so it's an advantage to anticipate time but the same is true for virtually all of our physiology for example when you eat you intoxicate yourself particularly with plant components most people believe that plants are much healthier than meat but uh, if you really uh, <laughs> investigate this problem, you come out with a different answer. So it's good to have these enzymes already high before you eat. So you're ready to react to the insult. No? And that can be said for most of the physiology. But this, till about uh, 15, 20 years ago, most people believe that we have a, a clock in the brain in a small structure called the suprachiasmatic nucleus that is located in a hypothalamus and this is also branched to the retina so this gets photic information, light information but of course in the, in the form of uh, electrical activity synaptic transmission and this can reset the clock but the clock actually runs no matter what you can keep mice for generations in, a, in the dark room, they don't mind because they don't like light. And they stay written not only through their lifetimes, but through the entire generation. So in 1997, the first, this was the big year for mammalian clock genes. The first clock gene was discovered by uh, Cho Takahashi, who's now at UT Southwestern, by normal genetics, you know, very, uh, very uh, work intensive uh, studies. And then the genomic studies came along, so we could just look up the Drosophila genes and see whether we find similar genes in the human, in the mouse genome, and this was done. And that's how the, the genes multiplied, you know, the clock genes, and now it's probably, I didn't count them, but there must be more than 20 that are important. Well, this was one thing, but once you can say, do we understand how these clock genes run a rhythm of approximately 24 hours? But the answer is no. There's still a lot to do. We don't understand how these 24 hours are generated. We do know that there's a feedback loop, and when you remove certain genes, the organism is flat, it doesn't have a clock anymore. But how exactly these 20 or 30 or 50 genes you know, adjust this period to 24 hours approximately, that we don't understand. So there's still lots to do. Anyway, so this was the story, and having these genes at hand, we could now check whether other tissues also have ups and downs in this right. gene expression and several labs including ours have done that and, and we have found that they actually go up and down in every tissue yeah so the question is, is do you need a clock for that you need a clock but it may still be the brain clock that sends out hormones yeah. that just drive these rhythms 
Yeah. So a postdoc in my laboratory was demonstrating that these cells actually do have clocks because you can take cultured cells but then synchronize their clocks. Clocks are actually a, a cell autonomous property. You don't need many cells. A one cell can do it. And so you have to synchronize them. If they're not synchronized, you, you will never see them. Yeah. And this is how, how we discovered these peripheral clocks. And then it turned out that uh, other people like uh, Menecker and Takahashi and other people, they took out tissue samples and showed that they have also clocks. And you can say that every of, of our three times 10 to the 13 cells, a large number of cells have a clock. Yeah. So um, in order to study the circadian clock uh, in live animals, so we lately devised uh, a real-time bioluminescence recorder of, of uh, That's right. clock genes, well, of a circadian clock uh, gene expression. Could you explain to us how the, this device works? Exactly. Again, I would like to say why we did this even, because the question is why do not just take uh, kill mice in every four hours and take tissue samples and extract RNA proteins and measure. First of all, it's quite cruel because in order to yeah. study to study like the phase shifting in peripheral exactly. organs, you would have to kill hundreds of mice. Yeah. And second, the resolution would be very poor because there are inter-individual differences and you only have one point every four hours or every two hours if you are killing even more mice. So this is not, this is not a, a, a very pleasant experiment. So we were motivated to engineer an apparatus, which we did together with our mechanical engineers. We are very lucky, we have very good mechanical engineers in our department. And with help of two physicist friends, photonics physicists, who helped us to guide photons that come out of the body if the, if the mice express a, a gene from the firefly under the control of circadian regulatory elements. So we can capture the photons and count them. So these photons come out of the mouse. These mice are in a completely light-proof uh, cage. Yeah. And the photons are guided towards the surface of a photomultiplier tube and then are counted. This is extremely sensitive and allows us to measure gene expression during months now. Because we can add the luciferin to the drinking water. And what, uh, what is the sensitivity of So how few cells can you... Uh... That's a very good question. So uh, I, I, we didn't determine the lower limit. We, we can say that a liver, if we inject adenoviral vectors to just put uh, these reported genes into the liver cells, so the liver is the only one that takes up these adenoviral vectors. Yeah. Then we get, uh, in the best cases, we get uh, 1 million photons per minute and the machine background is 1,000. So the, it's, then we get about, depending on the gene, like a 40, 50 fold amplitude. Yeah. So this is robust. Now you ask me a very good question, which is, could we use these, for example, for the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which only has 20,000 neurons? Yeah. And the answer is no. Okay. We are not yet there. Not yet. We, I think we could go down by a factor of 50, and we'll still get uh, robust cycles, yeah. but uh, not down to a few thousand new okay. rates. But, well, so far, so good, because you made some uh, very uh, interesting discoveries using this uh, device and other methods about how, um, how uh, the circadian clock is uh, regulated by environmental external cues, and how, uh, what is the transcriptional basis of that? Um, could you please perhaps um, highlight some of the most important findings you made? Yes. So we are very interested in how the suprachiasmatic nucleus, that is, as I already mentioned, itself adjusted every day by the photoperiod to exactly 24 hours. Yeah. Because it generates only approximately 24 hours. But of course, the clocks in all these other tissues, like liver, you know, imagine a liver in a human being, it doesn't get much light. <laughs> so there must be other ways to other ways to synchronize these what we call peripheral clocks. And this, of course, this is important to know because if if you have uh, billions of clocks but they are all all having a ticking a different rhythm, it doesn't help much for yeah, uh, for circadian physiology. Yeah. So the SCN uses a large number of signaling pathways, and some of them are quite indirect. <coughs> So we found relatively early on, it's already published in 2000, that the dominant 
time gavers in the field actually uses a German word, just Zeit gaber. Yeah. And the most dominant one are actually feeding fasting rhythms. I don't call them feeding rhythms because every, every feeding rhythm implies that there's also a fasting rhythm. Exactly. There. And I actually believe for reasons that I don't want to bore you and the audience with uh, that it's perhaps the fasting period that is more important in setting the clocks than the feeding. And we have reasons to say that. Uh, so this is dominant. Actually, the suprachiasmatic nucleus doesn't care about feeding. So if you invert the feeding rhythms, it still keeps its face. It's the, it's after all, it's the chief. Yeah. So it has its own face. So you can actually, under under these very unnatural conditions, where you impose conflicting feeding rhythms to the animal, you put the SCN phase in conflict with the feeding phase. So the feeding with the light. The cues of fasting no, not the even. Yeah, that's a very good question. It could be that, and to some extent it may be that, but it's actually even in constant darkness, the suprachiasmatic nucleus yeah. does not adapt to the feeding. Yeah. So it's actually its own rhythm that tries to keep the conflicting cycles, you know, it tries to change them, but it's not powerful enough. Yeah. And you can, so how do we know that actually, that there is, that there is a conflict? Because when we add, when we put them on day feeding, which for this nocturnal animal is not normal, and then we give food back at libidum, it only takes two days to get the old face. Yeah. But if you put, you know, we do the other the other way around. In other words, you have them on normal feeding, and then you put them on daytime feeding. It takes more than a week yeah. because the SCN is trying to fight. Yes. No, it keeps its face. So with this apparatus that I was just uh, explaining. We can actually measure this directly. So we can uh, take an animal that does or does not have a suprachiasmatic nucleus. We can actually lesion this tissue, can remove very precisely, like less than a cubic millimeter of the brain that has this structure. They're completely arrhythmic. And then you can make the liver and other organs, actually all organs, virtually arrhythmic by feeding rhythms. And then you switch the feeding rhythm, and it's almost immediate. If they don't have an SCN, yeah. but if they do have an SCN, it takes several days, right. two, two weeks. So that's how we know that the SCN is actually sending out other signals that that are in conflict now with feeding. Yeah. And one of these rhythms, uh, one of these signals, is glucocorticoid hormones. Mm -hmm. And we just identified a, a protein in the blood that is also used by the SCN. We don't know yet what that protein is. That's will be very difficult because it's a, a signal protein is very low concentration. But we know the pathway downstream that it regulates. It has to do with actin dynamics, with cytoskeleton dynamics. Yeah. So um, before we, we get to the concluding uh, question, it just, just occurred to me, so what, regardless of, of the SEN, um, if you have two, I don't know if it's even possible in nature, in nature but if you have two uh, contradicting environmental cues, is there a hierarchy, do we know even, is there a hierarchy to that or it's just in the matter of, ad, ad, uh, of of strength and duration that, that wins. Uh, how um, uh, you know? Um uh, okay, we should first of all we should be clear about the following. If we impose feeding rhythms, yeah. this is very artificial. We yeah. use these to measure phase shifting kinetics and to measure the contribution of particular signaling pathways. But of course, this is somewhat artificial. Yeah. So, the feeding rhythms are dominant over the SCN. SCN cannot keep the phase of the periphery. Yeah, for long, yeah. So it's dominant. Yeah. It tries to do so, but it's unsuccessfully. And even if you remove a pathway from the SCN, like glucocorticoid signaling, or even the, the new signaling pathway that we discovered, and that I will talk about, you still will adjust the phase to the feeding at the end. So it's, uh, it's it's either if it's from the SCN, then it goes faster. If it's from the feeding, yeah. it, it's just slower. As a matter of persistence, eventually. Exactly. So yeah. imagine several pathway. Remove one from this side. Feeding will still win, yeah. but depending on which side you remove the pathway, it goes faster, or, or it takes more time. Right. So if if we extrapolate from these results in mice to humans. What do the what do this what does this uh, teach us about um, some of the more common medical problems that uh, humans have? 
Uh, so do you, they have a circadian uh, component to them? I mean, of course, there's more and more perturbance of the uh, of the normal adjusting or synchronization of the clock. You know, if you read the, your uh, smartphone at night before you go to bed in bed, it has a, a lot of green light, and the yeah. green light is the one that shifts the face. Yeah. Then, of course, you have the shift workers, people who, who work, uh, have rotating shift work, so, you know, one week they work during the night, one week they work during the day. And I think it is fair to say that the impact is much lower than I would have anticipated. In other oh. words, if you look at cancer incidents and so on, right. first of all, the question is, is it really the circadian clock perturbance or, or lifestyle else, or other exactly. things? But it takes long, it takes more than 10 years. So if you, like me, you can really probably me you as well, you travel too frequently. You know, I travel too frequently and they have a lot of jet lags all the time, yeah. but this is not going to kill me, I think. You hope. It's a, well, <laughs> it's not going to, it's not, a, not, not circadian a rhythm perturbance is very, is very unpleasant yeah. because you have sleep problems, you have digestive problems sometimes, yeah. but it's not word killer number one, yeah. it is fair to say. Okay. <laughs> so I believe... It is a important, you know, to you have to, your physiology uh, rhythmic and so on, but one also shouldn't ex uh, over-exaggerate the consequences of perturbances if they don't last for decades. Right. Well, with these uh, optimistic uh, remarks uh, and this interview, thank you very much. It's very interesting. My pleasure. Thank you very much.